Welcome to the Freak Show, fellow freaks. I'm Matthew Brockmeyer. And I'm Krista Carmen. And this is... Murder Coaster. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to part two of our portrait of literary outlaw, William S. Burroughs. If you haven't listened to part one, we highly recommend that you do. Last week, we saw Burroughs go from a shy, introverted child to a Harvard-educated, aspiring writer with a wife and child who is also a petty criminal, drug fiend, heroin addict, and proud homosexual with a long arrest record, who, with his friends Jack Kerouac and Allen Ginsberg, was forming a new bohemian culture and literary movement that would become defined as the Beat Generation. When we last left off, Burroughs had fled the United States after getting busted for heroin in New Orleans and had just returned to his family in Mexico City after a fruitless trip in search of ayahuasca in the jungles of South America. Buckle up and enjoy the ride as we bring you the second and final installment in our series of cultural icon godfather of punk and pope of dope William S. Burroughs patron saint of the underground let's begin chapter 5 the ticket that exploded Mexico City September 6th 1951 How? How could this have happened? He hadn't studied the signs. He should have known, seen it coming. There must be some kind of entity within him, making him do these horrible things. An ugly spirit. William Burroughs and his wife Joan had gone to their friend John Healy's room above the Bounty Bar on 122 Monterey, Colonia Roma, Mexico City, to sell Bill's 380 automatic pistol, a cheap gun Burroughs didn't like, as it shot low. And that bar is still there, now a nondescript little restaurant, and they still rent out that doomed and forlorn apartment above it. As they waited for the buyer who wanted the gun to arrive, they drank gin from dirty glasses, laughing and joking. Joan saying if they had to rely on William's hunting skills to survive, they'd all starve to death. To which William replied, Why don't we show them what a good shot old Bill is? Time for our old William Tell game. Joan then turned her head to the side and balanced her glass of gin on her head, saying, I can't look, you know. I hate the sight of blood. William Burroughs then pointed the pistol at the glass, perched there on his wife's head, and from ten feet away, squeezed the trigger. The shot ringing out, deafening in the little room. When Joan tumbled off her chair, William thought she was joking at first. Then he saw the glass rolling toward him, perfectly intact. And when he glanced back at Joan, sprawled there on the ground, he saw there was a bullet hole in her temple, with a small puddle of blood sluicing out the wound. What had he done? He ran to her, weeping. No, 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 Joan! 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 It couldn't be possible. It had to be a dream. A bad, bad dream. But it wasn't. It was very, very real. Joan was pronounced dead on arrival at the hospital. She was only 27 years old. So young. As this group of bohemians that would become known as the Beat Generation birthed so much of what we call the counterculture today, Joan could be considered the first of the 27 Club. 
wild child artists and musicians like Jimi Hendrix, Kurt Cobain, Jim Morrison, Janis Joplin, and Amy Winehouse that lived a full and crazy life of madness and drugs before dying young at the age of just 27. Joan was buried in the American Cemetery in Mexico City, where her body was kept for seven years. Afterwards, it was disinterred and her remains thrown in a bone heap. Joan's parents came and retrieved little Julie, Joan's daughter. Billy, or William III, who was four now, was sent to Burroughs' parents in St. Louis, speaking more Spanish than English. Burroughs was locked up in Lacumber Prison, known as the Black Palace. He'd say he was treated very well and was surprised at the graciousness and kindness from both the guards and the prisoners. His lawyer, Burnaby Hurardo, promised him he'd get out. Bribes were apparently made, hands greased, and he was only charged with criminal imprudence, which carried a maximum sentence of five years. And he was released on bail after being in jail less than two weeks. But bail in Mexico is much different than the United States. It's more like probation. He had to report to the prison and sign in every Monday, and any infraction would land him back in prison. Burroughs' oldest brother, Mort, came to Mexico to help him sort out the legal matters. His brother, who was known for being cold and stone-faced, the responsible one, wrapped his arms around Bill and told him, Blood is a hell of a lot thicker than water, causing Burroughs to break down and sob uncontrollably, his brother saying, Don't, Bill, don't. But amidst all the chaos and darkness... Publisher A.A. A. Wynne bought Burroughs' book, Junkie, in April 1952 for a $1,000 advance on royalties, sold by Allen Ginsberg, acting as Burroughs' literary agent, who'd managed to pull the deal off because of a friend he'd met in a mental hospital, Carl Solomon, whose uncle was the publisher. Ginsberg would later dedicate the poem How to his deeply troubled friend, Carl. Funnily enough, when Ginsburg had shown Carl Solomon Jack Kerouac's huge roll of paper that was the manuscript to On the Road, it horrified him. Solomon did say Kerouac was a, quote, brilliant young punk, but said his writing was, quote, that of a nasty, stupid, worthless, idiot brat. (laughs) Uh, Brilliant young punk. And of course, seven years later, that book would change the world and define a generation. Just goes to show you, editors and publishers, they're just people with their own opinions. But Junkie was published as a 35-cent, two-books-in-one pulp paperback with Narcotics Agent by Maurice Helbrandt. Man, I would love to have a copy of that book. It is so pulp-looking, too. And uh, it's really cool-looking, you gotta admit. (laughs) Um. The book was completely unnoticed, so unnoticed, in fact, that there was not a single review of it, not one. And it was published under the pen name William Lee, Lee being Burroughs' mother's maiden name. But it sold 113,370 copies the first year alone, which was quite good. It's basically a nonfiction true crime book. The pop stuff sold in newsstands and drugstores as opposed to literary books and bookstores. True crime books and magazines were always hot sellers, even before Truman Capote came along and turned it into a legitimate literature and art form. But William Burroughs was now a professional writer. Legitimate, bona fide. Burroughs then wrote another book about his life living outside of society as an outlaw, trying to bypass and short-circuit control. This one about his homosexuality called Queer, a sequel to Junkie. But the publishers thought Junkie was dangerous enough and didn't think the public was ready for a book on the gay underground just yet. In fact, they thought if they published it, there was a good chance they'd end up in jail. And they may have been right, for eventually people would go to jail for selling the books of William Burroughs. Jack Kerouac showed up in Mexico City for a while, 
bitter and sullen that all his friends were getting published now, and he couldn't sell on the road, which he considered a masterpiece. Don't stop believing, Jack! You can do it! (laughs) It'll happen! That's kind of crazy that he couldn't sell it, but... Burroughs, meanwhile, was back on heroin. He'd be on and off junk the rest of his long life. Going to score, he was pickpocketed of $200, a very large sum for him. Then his lawyer, in a fit of rage when a teenager sideswiped his Cadillac, shot the kid in the leg, and the kid ended up dying of tetanus. So his lawyer was facing murder charges himself and fled Mexico for Brazil. And Burroughs decided to do the same. Skip town, forfeiting his $2,000 bond. Eventually, a Mexican judge would give him a suspended sentence of two years in absentia. Still frustrated, he'd never been able to track down the psychedelic plant Yage, the key ingredient in ayahuasca. Burroughs headed back into the jungle. Chapter 6. The Yage Letters Burroughs traveled to Panama, sending his son Billy exotic butterflies in glass cases. Butterflies his son would treasure the rest of his life. Burroughs got dysentery, which I've actually had and is no joke. It can kill you. He then moved to Bogota, where he visited the botany department of the local university. He was in a large, dusty room full of plant specimens when an American professor burst in yelling, Where are my coca specimens? That man was Richard Evans Schultz, who was not only a world authority on hallucinogenics, but had attended Harvard at the same time as William, graduating the year after him in 1936. The two hit it off. Schultz told Burroughs he had ingested Yaga himself telling him how it came from a vine botanically known as Banipsteriosis. The natives stripped the bark from the vine, pounding it into a mush and boiling it in water, often adding other ingredients, and called the brew ayahuasca. He instructed Burroughs to go down the Putumayo River on the borders between Ecuador, Peru, and Colombia and find a medicine man there, telling Burroughs to bring a hammock, a rubber bag, and all kinds of medicines. Burroughs then ventured forth by train, bus, mule, and canoe, ending up at an end-of-the-road town named Moko, where the local medicine man prepared him a cold-water infusion of the bark from the Yaga vine, far less powerful than actual ayahuasca. But Burroughs had his first Yaga trip, seeing colors and having strange visions of ancient temples merged with New York City. He traveled on by motorboat, by canoe, deeper into the Amazonian rainforest. In Puerto Assis, on the border of the three countries, he was forced to return to Makoa because of passport issues. But in a dusty jungle bar, Burroughs met a German man who told him he knew a real shaman that would perform a true ayahuasca ceremony. Burroughs went deep into the jungle, where he was taken to a thatch hut with a dirt floor. There was a wooden altar with a crucifix and a picture of the Virgin Mary adorned with feathers. On a rough tripod of wooden stakes was a wooden bowl. A wizened old man, grinning mischievously, mumbled incantations over the bowl, sweeping at the air with a small broom to blow away any evil spirits. He then poured a small amount of black oily liquid from the bowl into a cup. Burroughs drank it down, thinking for a moment it couldn't be enough to do anything. But within two minutes, he was flying. His first sensation was extreme paranoia, and he leapt up and ran from the hut, tumbling down outside where he was engulfed in colors, saying the world looked like a Van Gogh painting. The medicine man found him, stood over him, asking him to go back into the hut. Burroughs refused, lying there in the dirt for four hours, saying he reached a state of pure bisexuality when he could become man or woman at will. Eventually, he went back to the hut and lay down beneath a blanket, shivering and finally dozing off. He awoke in the morning, expecting to find himself sick and nauseous, but instead, he felt fantastic, rejuvenated. He vowed to find different medicine men with different varieties of the ayahuasca brew. 
He headed to Lima, where he got a hotel of sorts, a literal hole in the wall, where he was robbed of his advance on Junkie. Ugh, that's so sad. <laughs> Forcing him to live on the $200 a month allowance from his parents, which he still received. He was 39 years old and felt the older he got, the dumber he got. He'd go on to take ayahuasca five more times, saying it was the most powerful drug he'd ever experienced. A book was published about his experience in the form of letters he had written to Allen Ginsberg, but just be aware that these aren't actual real letters. They were fabrications from notes Burroughs had taken at the time, and they just used the old epistolary literary device to tell the story. In August 1953, Burroughs returned to the United States. It was a different decade, a different culture, a different world, and he was horrified by it. So complacent, so conformist, so many rules and regulations and control everywhere. A virus of control telling people how to look, how to act, who to have sex with, what substances were okay, like alcohol and cigarettes. True killers and which substances were not to be tolerated, like harmless marijuana. 1950s America was so square that even Allen Ginsberg had gone straight. He actually had a girlfriend and was working a nine to five job making stock market quotations for the World Telegram. As Burroughs would say, a regular job drains one's very lifeblood. It's supposed to. They want everything you got. But Ginsburg let Burroughs move into a spare room in his apartment. And this is where Burroughs met Gregory Corso, a young, wild, beat poet who would become closely associated with the group of bohemian writers. And it was at this point that William Burroughs and Allen Ginsberg became lovers. William Burroughs just needed someone. He was so haunted by the death of Joan, he would be the rest of his life. He blamed himself and felt like such an outcast, misfit, loser. He needed to be held, to be loved, to be kissed, cradled and cared for, even mothered in a way. Ginsburg was actually attracted to muscular, good-looking young men, not emaciated junkies who looked 10 years older than their 40 rugged years. But he did love Burroughs on a deep human level. He always had. Not sexually or even romantically, but on a deeper, purer level. He loved his spirit, his essence, who he was. So Alan slept with Burroughs and became his boyfriend and lover. Burroughs was the passive one. He had no desire in penetrating Alan. During sex, he'd become very feminine, taking on a very womanly role, giving of himself and able to climax in that way alone. But though passive physically, Burroughs was a very needy lover emotionally. He wanted them to always be together and to bond so tightly they spiritually mutated into a form of symbiosis, a protoplasmic union. And this was not what Alan wanted. He just didn't feel that way about his friend and told him so, thinking of the William Carlos William quote, unworldly love that has no hope of the world and that cannot change the world to its desire. Eventually, becoming less poetic about it and more forceful, Allen Ginsberg would just plain tell William, look, I don't want your old man dick. <laughs> uh, so his heart broken, Burroughs decided to head off to Europe, announcing, quote, I'm going to steep myself in vice. Uh-oh. <laughs> he jumped on a Greek ocean freighter and 12 days later was in Rome. He hated Rome, but he'd been reading the books of acclaimed novelist Paul Bowles, The Sheltering Sky, and Let It Come Down, which were set in Morocco. And he'd heard Tangiers had a, quote, reputation for wickedness. So he headed off to northern Africa to dig the scene and check out what all the talk was about. Chapter 7. The Inner Zone. In Morocco, he suffered crippling depressions. Everywhere he went, he was haunted by the ghost of Joan. He couldn't escape her death and was racked with guilt and remorse. He discovered Eucadol, a German synthetic morphine so powerful it had been pulled from the market, but was still available over the counter 
without a prescription there in Tangiers, the International Zone, which had its very own, very lax laws. Yukidal was excellent at killing the pain, the existential angst and soul-crippling guilt, and the strangeness of Tangiers, a place so alien to his proper, wholesome, American Midwest upbringing, served as a wonderful backdrop to lose himself in. He found Tangiers to be the capital of the stranded, the lost, the outcasts, misfits, the druggies, queers, artists, and weirdos. A place where the freaks of the world would find themselves as they sought to break free from the conformity and the control mechanisms of society. Burroughs met and eventually befriended Paul Bowles, the two being very much alike. Bowles was also gay, though he was married to a woman whom he loved very much and considered his intellectual equal, like Burroughs and Joan. And Bowles also enjoyed dipping into opiates and consuming copious amounts of cannabis as well. And his writing, though very literary, was nihilistic and dark. But Bowles was accepted by the intelligentsia, was prestigious, and kept it together whereas Burroughs was an outcast who gave in to his afflictions and addictions, full throttle. Burroughs descended into utter addiction for over a year, sticking a syringe into his veins hourly, wasting away to nothing, not bothering to bathe or change his clothes, living in filth and squalor. But worst of all, he couldn't write. He tried, but the strong opiate numbed his brain, as well as his body, and he'd find himself just staring at his toe for weeks on end. Meanwhile, Allen Ginsberg had decided to embrace his wild poet side, had quit his stock market research job and moved to North Beach, San Francisco, where he began his genre-defining poem, Howl, dedicating it to Carl Solomon, who was now in a mental institution being given electric shock therapy and spending much of his time in a straitjacket. As 1955 turned into 1956, William Burroughs hit rock bottom. It was either kick dope and get his act together or wither away into nothingness and die. He went to London where a Dr. John Dent was pioneering a new form of opium addiction treatment using a morphine derivative called apomorphine made by boiling morphine in hydraulic acid. The stuff made Burroughs sick as a dog, vomiting in minutes. For the first four days, he didn't sleep at all, as he was given injections of apomorphine followed by lower and lower doses of morphine, until it reached the point that he wasn't being given actual morphine at all, just the apomorphine, which was actually a relief to wean himself from. And within two weeks, he was completely clean. It worked. He vowed he'd never do opiates again, a vow he'd keep for, well, well, much longer than you'd think. <laughs> of course, he ended up back on dope. He's William Burroughs. But this point in time ushered in a moment of tremendous creativity and commitment to the craft of writing that would last a surprisingly long time. For over a year, Burroughs would immerse himself in writing what would become Naked Lunch, probing his mind with words, with the same intensity and dedication that he had previously filled his veins with opiates. Chapter 8. After the Lunch As Allen Ginsberg and William Burroughs worked feverishly, trying to form the bizarre ramblings of Naked Lunch into a book, their world in New York was exploding, and everything was about to change forever. Review copies of Jack Kerouac's On the Road had been released, and in September of 1956, the New York Times declared it a major American novel. Gilbert Milstein saying, quote, Its publication is a historic occasion, end quote. Lavishing it with praise and saying, quote, There are sections of On the Road in which the writing is of a beauty almost breathtaking. There is some writing on jazz that has never been equaled in American fiction, either for insight, style, or technical virtuosity, end quote. Kerouac was declared the new Hemingway and overnight was famous worldwide as the face 
of the Beat Generation. And when the book was released on New Year's Day, 1957, it was on the bestseller list for five weeks straight. Their time had truly come. Burroughs decided he'd had enough of Tangiers. It was in the midst of great changes, ones that didn't suit Burroughs. France was giving Morocco back its independence. The king had returned, and one of his first pronouncements was that he would abolish Tangiers' international status. It would become a normal Moroccan city like any other. A prescription from a doctor would now be needed to buy drugs at a pharmacy. Homosexuality would go back to being a crime. The wilder nightclubs would have to shut down. Overnight, hundreds of businesses closed and homes went up for sale. Forty tons of gold was transferred out of Tangier's banks. The virus of control and bureaucracy was spreading its slimy tentacles out, a sick cancer of laws and regulations choking out the freaks of Morocco. So Burroughs decided to move to Paris, where Alan was living, trying to sell his book. And this was an amazing period. Paris in the late 50s and early 60s. They lived in a flop house at 9 Rue Git Le Cour that was so squalid and run down, the place didn't even have a name. But it soon got one. The Beat Hotel. It was dingy, dirty, lit by bare bulbs. Each floor had a shared bathroom with just a hole for a toilet and some shredded newspaper. It was run by a short woman named Madame Rousseau, a real character, who'd only let you stay there if she liked you. But once you were in, she'd let her tenants do whatever they pleased and asked no questions. It was full of writers, painters, poets, and bohemians, hustlers, sex workers, and drug fiends. A sign in the lobby read, No opium smoking in the elevators. <laughs> That's a cool sign. <laughs> Burroughs loved the Beat Hotel. He loved the smell of dust and cigarettes. He loved that no one bothered you. And he fit right in with all the down-and-out painters, poets, musicians, hustlers, and dope dealers. And he just loved the world of left-bank Paris, the cafes and the bars. Ellen Ginsberg, working as William's literary agent, took naked lunch around, first to Olympia Press, who published pornographic novels for tourists and sailors, but dabbled in literature no one else would publish, such as Vladimir Nabokov's Lolita. This press was something else, I tell you. Check out how they ran. So it was run by this guy, Maurice Giordias, and every spring he'd print a catalog and send it out to this mailing list he had of 2,000 weird shops and crazy bookstores. The catalog would be full of titles for books like with open mouth, and I've got a whip in my suitcase, written by authors like Carmencita de las Lunas. But in actuality, the books did not exist. Maurice just made up the names, and when the orders came in, he'd go down to the Beat Hotel, where all these American writers were living, and pay them to write pornography books, or as he called them, dirty books, or DBs based on the title that he had made up. Patrick Bowles actually wrote Roman Orgy under the name Marcus Von Heller there. And a lot of future legitimate writers made money doing this. 5,000 copies of every dirty book were printed, and they would immediately be banned for pornography. But it took six months of bureaucratic paperwork to get the book banned. And in that six months... They'd sell out, especially during tourist season. And in the winter, he'd just start all over again and make a new batch of books with titles that had yet to be banned. And the whole operation was so successful that Marie started publishing literary books deemed too offensive for mainstream publication, like Samuel Beckett's Watt and Nabokov's Lolita. When he published Lolita, at first, the only thing that happened was he received angry letters saying it wasn't dirty enough, that it wasn't pornographic, which is what the customers wanted. But then, esteemed author Graham Greene said in the Times Literary Supplement that Lolita was one of the three best books of the year. And a whole controversy arose 
many people accusing Green of promoting pornography. But custom agents took a look at the book and deemed it not pornographic and let it into the United States. And it became an American bestseller, making a ton of money for Maurice and his French press. Kinsberg had brought Maurice a manuscript of Naked Lunch, proclaiming it to be the masterpiece of the century. But it was literally dirty, the pages themselves filthy and torn, the edges chewed on by rats. There were parts pasted onto other parts and loose bits falling out of it. So Maurice had turned it down. It didn't look readable. It literally smelled bad, and Maurice thought it was <laughs> insulting they'd even asked him to read a manuscript in such poor condition. And Lawrence Ferlinghetti at City Lights Books, who had published Hal and the Yage Letters, said Naked Lunch was disgusting and refused to publish it. <laughs> but the Black Mountain Review, a literary magazine in North Carolina run by Ezra Pound's former secretary, published small parts of it, as well as pieces by Kerouac and Ginsburg in their final issue, seemingly cementing the movement afoot. Here were the three pillars of the Beat Generation, Kerouac, Ginsburg, and Burroughs, published all together for the first time. Critics of these unshaven and dirty beatniks and their hedonistic work, trying to tie them to the dreaded communism and red scare of Russia, started calling them beatniks, taking Kerouac's statement of the beat generation and adding a Russian Sputnik twist to it. Though it was an insult, beatnik was a term that would stick. In many ways, they were universally hated, hated by the liberal establishment, for being apolitical, drugged-up outsiders who didn't help with the cause, and hated by Eisenhower Republicans as a threat to American middle-class values and morality, which they absolutely were. They literally wanted to overturn the tables on conformist 1950s square America, and they would. And in 1960, J. Edgar Hoover, head of the FBI, would say at the Republican convention that America's three biggest menaces were communists, beatniks, and eggheads. <laughs> eggheads just means nerds. I don't know why it's so mean to nerds. If you want to understand just how straight and conformist they were back then, the editor of Commentary Magazine complained that Jack Kerouac's hair was too long because it fell over his forehead. I don't know if you guys see many pictures about of Jack Kerouac. He does not have long hair. <laughs> if your hair could touch your forehead, it was too long in 1960. They sure were in for a surprise about what was about to happen in the next 10 years. Burroughs began to get a reputation as being the wise man of the Beat Hotel, the Beat Nick Pope, and young people would come to visit him. He'd greet them nicely, then sit across from them, staring into their eyes while saying, I love you. I hate you. I love you. I hate you. I love you. I hate you. Over and over until they left. <laughs> then the Chicago Review, the literary magazine of the University of Chicago, published a nine-page excerpt of Naked Lunch. It caused such an uproar that the issue was suppressed by the school, copies were held back and not allowed to be sold, and the editors all resigned in protest. And the entire publication actually imploded and ceased to exist. But the disgruntled editors all got together and formed a new literary magazine under a name suggested to them by Jack Kerouac, Big Table. The first issue came out in March 1959, and it had 10 sections of Naked Lunch and Kerouac's Old Angel Midnight. The Chicago Post Office seized several hundred copies, saying they were pornographic because of the use of obscenities, which made the issue incredibly popular. Now everyone wanted to read it, and the printing of 10,000 copies quickly sold out, selling massive amounts in New York City and San Francisco. Eventually, the obscenity case went to court in Chicago, and Judge Julius Hoffman said, quote, The use of obscenities in a work is insufficient to classify it obscene. 
He deemed it to be not pornographic, and the held issues were eventually released. But because of the controversy, Maurice was suddenly interested in publishing Naked Lunch. Selling and shipping suppressed books was his specialty. And he asked to take another look at the dirty manuscript. His customers, expecting titillating erotica to sell to tourists, sure were going to be surprised when they saw what they got when they ordered Naked Lunch. But Maurice told Burroughs that if he could get the book into a printable form in 10 days, he'd give him an $800 advance. Burroughs accepted. Working feverishly at the Beat Hotel, Burroughs prepared batches of the manuscript. He would bring the printer finished sections in random order, and when the galleys came back, he just left them in that random order, making very minimal changes. And that's the reason the sections of the book you read today are in that order. Just random chance. Burroughs designed the jacket, corrected the proofs, and Maurice was so impressed, he had 10,000 copies printed, double the average book from Olympia. Immediately, they were getting asked for foreign rights, getting $400 for the German rights, and Grove Press buying the American rights for 3000 his biggest paycheck yet. And Burroughs used his newfound riches to get the best heroin he could and get himself completely addicted again. He'd lasted two years. It's not bad. (laughs) Yeah, it's it's not bad. (laughs) Though complications caused the American printing to be delayed by many years, the French printing of Naked Lunch was causing a small stir in literary circles. And Life magazine actually came to interview him saying, quote, Burroughs lives alone on his second floor room in the Beat Hotel, where he sleeps and writes. The small room is lighted by a single 40-watt bulb, end quote. The reporter notes how Burroughs openly smokes large amounts of marijuana, to which Burroughs says, When I speak of drug addiction, I do not refer to Keith marijuana or any preparation of hashish, mescaline, sacred mushrooms, or any other drugs of the hallucinogen group. There is no evidence that the use of any hallucinogen results in physical dependence. The action of these drugs is physiologically opposite to the action of junk. Asked to write a short biography, he wrote, I have no past life at all being a notorious plant of intrusion. Harvard, 1936, A.B. Nobody saw him there, but he had the papers on him. Functioned once as an exterminator in Chicago and learned some basic principles of force majorie. Achieved a state of inanimate matter in Tangiers with chemical assistance. The article ridiculed the scene, saying, quote, The bulk of beat writers are undisciplined and slovenly amateurs who have deluded themselves into believing their lugubrious absurdities are art simply because they have rejected the form, style, and attitudes of previous generations and have seized upon obscenity as an expression, end quote. But it was sympathetic to Burroughs, saying, quote, For sheer horror, no member of the Beat Generation has achieved effects to compare with William S. Burroughs. Naked Lunch could be described as an effort to communicate the degradation of addiction in epic terms. End quote. But his parents were not amused. Having Life magazine print an article about your son saying he was a murdering drug addict writing pornography in a cheap French flop house does not register well with the High Society of St. Louis, Missouri. They were mortified. His mother wrote him a nasty letter, and he wrote back saying it was all just part of branding and compared himself to English sorcerer Alistair Crawley. And uh, I have to say, they do remind me of each other in a lot of ways. Hmm, interesting. Right? Um, Brian Gisson, a good friend of Burroughs who run a wild nightclub back in Tangiers, was also living in the Beat Hotel at the time. He'd been involved with the Surrealists as a teenager. And together, Brian and William invented this writing process called the cut-up method, where 
separate pieces of writing are cut into halves or quarters with a scissor and then put together in random order, leading to bizarre and random phrases. To Geisen, it reflected the sensibilities of the surrealist movement because it was random and illogical and following in the footsteps of the montage was in fact basically a word montage. But to Burroughs, it represented magical anarchy and a means of short-circuiting control, of literally distorting space and time. He'd later say in an interview, looking whimsical on a rooftop with Allen Ginsberg, If you have a pre-recorded universe in which everything is pre-recorded, the only thing that is not pre-recorded are the pre-recordings themselves. So with cut-ups... I was attempting to tamper with the pre-recordings. I think I have succeeded with some modesty. And then he just smiles into the camera like a naughty boy who has just cut a hole in the space-time continuum. (laughs) I mean, I don't know about all this. I respect it, but it's kind of hard for me to read sometimes. I I prefer a more linear type of writing, a real story. It's it's just like avant-garde poetry, you know? You do get these cool word salads. Um, Here, you read this one. It's like a beautiful poem. Read it like a beautiful poem or a song from Disney. Oh, okay. With their diseases and orgasm drugs and their sexless parasite life forms, heavy metal people of Uranus, wrapped in cool blue mist of vaporized banknotes, and the insect people of Minrod with metal music. It's kind of cool, right? I don't know. It's, but, I mean, uh, it's fun to say. <laughs> I mean, it's got an essence, a feel. It's like a song, you know? But technically, you know, the term heavy metal came from a cut-up. You know, if not an actual cut-up, then William Burroughs' mind, which is <laughs> like sees everything fragmented and weird. Um, or maybe... Just maybe he actually did cut a hole in the pre-recorded fabric of the space-time continuum to either create the word or become supernaturally aware of its coming existence. Beckett visited him and was <laughs> appalled with the cut-up technique. Said it wasn't writing, but plumbing. I don't know. It's not something that I could ever do. That's for damn sure. I mean, because we're storytellers. He's, it's, it's like a poet thing, you know, a songwriter. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but people like blackout poetry. It's um, it's not that much different. Yeah, that's an interesting like comparison because I've admired people who who I don't even know if you say write blackout poetry or create blackout poetry, but uh, I mean that that was maybe a little dismissive. Of course, you're writing it. You're you're creating something in your head and, and using the words on the page. But are you writing it? You are creating it. I think I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Same it's with weird. the cut up. Are you writing it? I mean, if it's your writing. I know. But I mean, I guess when you write anything, you're using words that already exist and you're just like, I don't know. Right. It's, it's weird. Um, but it's not something that I've ever like I've dabbled and I say dabbled in like the strongest sense of the word. Like I've probably only written one piece of poetry in my entire life that I think is like worth seeing the light of day and everything else is complete and utter trash. <laughs> but I've never, so there's like a desire there for me sometimes, but I've never had the desire to write blackout poetry. How about you? No, I'm, I I write a little tiny bit of poetry once in a while, usually just for myself. Um, Like, I don't I like Edgar Allan Poe. I'm a huge Shakespeare fan. I love Shakespeare, but as a rule, I'm not really that big into poetry. I like yeah, I, I, I like it, but I like a very specific kind of it. And I don't even know yeah. enough about poetry to tell you what that kind is. I just know what I like when I see it. I'm friends with a lot of poets. Yep, same. <laughs> <laughs> Check out this madness of cut up from uh, from the novel Nova Express. Listen to my last words anywhere. Listen to my last words any world. Listen, all you bored syndicates and governments of the earth and you powers behind what filth consummated in what lavatory to take what is not yours. To sell the ground from unborn feet forever. Don't let them see us. Don't let them tell what we are doing. 
Are these the words of the all-powerful boards and syndicates of the earth? For God's sake, don't let that Coca-Cola thing out. Not the cancer deal with the Venusians, not the green deal. Don't show them that. Not the orgasm, death, not the ovens. Listen, I call you all. Show your cards, all players. Pay it all, pay it all, pay it all back. Pay it all, pay it all, pay it all back for all to see in Times Square in Piccadilly. Premature, premature, give us a little more time. Time for what? More lies. Premature, premature for who? I say to all, these words are not premature. These words may be too late, minutes to go, minutes to foe, gold, top secret, classified for the more of the elite, the initiates. Are these the words of the all-powerful boards and syndicates of the earth? These are the words of liars, cowards, collaborators, traitors, liars who want time for more lies. Cowards, you cannot face your dogs, your errand boys. You're human animals with the truth. Collaborators with insect people, with vegetable people, with any people anywhere who offer you a body forever, to shit forever. For this, you have sold out your sons, sold the ground from unborn feet forever. Traitors to all souls everywhere, you want the name of Hassan I. Saba on your filth deeds to sell out the unborn? What scared you all into time, into body, into shit? I will tell you the word. Alien word. The. The word of alien enemy imprisons thee in time, in body, in shit. Prisoner, come out. The great skies are open. Chapter (laughs) 9. Flower Power. That crazy rascal, Allen Ginsberg, who'd been just a starry-eyed kid all those years ago in New York City, would prove pivotal to the coming hippie movement when in 1960 he joined forces with Harvard psychology professor Timothy Leary, who had started a research project into psilocybin, the psychedelic compound found in hallucinogenic mushrooms, working with famed authors Aldous Huxley, author of Brave New World. Huxley had famously written about psychedelics in The Doors of Perception after using mescaline. Huxley was then 66 and nearly blind, absolutely loved psilocybin, saw it as a religious grace. Ginsburg, Leary, and Huxley came to believe that psychedelic drugs could be a means of reaching higher states of consciousness and change humanity. Ginsburg encouraged Leary to reach out to his friend William Burroughs, who knew everything there was to know about drugs and had gone on many ayahuasca trips with shamans in the South American jungle. In January of 1961, Leary wrote to Burroughs, This letter is thought by many to be the genesis of the 60s movement the hippies, and the psychedelic revolution, as the old guard joins forces with the new vanguard and youth counterculture blooms into an unstoppable force. Burroughs wrote Leary back, saying, I think what you are doing is vitally important. Yes, I would be very much interested in trying the mushrooms and writing up the trip. I think the wider use of these drugs would lead to better conditions At all levels. Perhaps whole areas of neurosis could be mapped and eradicated in mass therapy. They gave psilocybin to Jack Kerouac, who was slowly slipping into severe alcoholism. He didn't like them, but old Neil Cassidy loved them and called them the, quote, Rolls Royce of dope. Leary sent Burroughs some mushrooms. But Burroughs said they made him nauseated and irritable, and he had visions of little green men with fungoid gills swarming him. Of course he did. He's William Burroughs. Burroughs then returned to Tangiers in April to spend the summer. It was a different place, no longer the international zone, but ruled by the King of Morocco, and the Spanish had all left, 
meaning it was no longer as multicultural and tolerant. And there were all these strange young people, long-haired men with sandals and beards, wearing beads, and young women dressed in black who wore smears of black eye makeup. Self-proclaimed beatniks. They got on Burroughs' nerves, but they were what he himself had created, coming there because of him. And then Leary and Ginsburg showed up with more psilocybin pills, eager to trip with William Burroughs. Leary and Ginsburg each ate five of the potent psilocybin pills. And William Burroughs, he goes and eats 15 of them. He's fucking nuts. He just gobbles down three times as much mushrooms as Timothy Leary. And dude, you know, mushrooms can kick your fucking ass. Be careful with that shit out there, you guys. And he proceeds to have a terrible trip, was unable to speak, mumbling gibberish, stumbling, unable to walk, and telling them, I would like to sound a word of warning. I am not feeling too well. I was struck by juxtaposition of purple-fired mushroom from the pain banks. Urgent warning. I think I'll stay here in shriveling envelopes of larval flesh. You, you fellas go down to the fair and see film and brainwaves turning in on soulless insect people. Burroughs did not think that the psilocybin pills were the greatest psychedelic drug. They made him nauseous and he'd had bad trips. It's also not his first rodeo. He'd eaten mescaline before, which is often just processed peyote, not to mention drunken actual ayahuasca brewed in the rainforest of the Amazon several times. He tells Paul Bowles, Nothing will get another psilocybin pill down this throat. I am, of course, not expressing my feelings on the subject of Timothy Leary, lest he cut off the money. But Leary flies Burroughs to Harvard in August of 1961, where he writes a paper on the difference between narcotic and psychedelic drugs. And at Harvard, Burroughs was very unimpressed with Leary's operation. Too much wealth and opulence spent haphazardly, a perfect example of American excess and crass commercialization. Piles of unused recording equipment and weird technological toys, wasted food, and all kinds of silly, ridiculous talk about love and cosmic unity and higher planes of consciousness. When Burroughs wanted to talk about Neurological implants and brainwave generators. Burroughs thought Timothy Leary was a clown, that the whole endeavor was a joke, and after a month jumped ship, saying, They had utterly no interest in any scientific work. I hope never to set eyes on that horse's ass again. A real wrong number. And Leary said, rather revealingly, quote, he declined to join our game, which is developing into a religious do-good cult. And just two months after William Burroughs left, Timothy Leary discovered another psychedelic drug that would come to change the world in many ways, called LSD. And just let that sink in for a second. The whole world is about to change. And while Allen Ginsberg is on the East Coast at Harvard with Leary, Wild child Neil Cassidy is on the West Coast in California, hanging out with new luminary author Ken Kesey, who'd also discovered LSD working in a psychiatric unit and doing research for his novel, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. While Leary is making a self-described psychedelic cult and religion, Kesey is using the drug as a means of anarchy, of breaking down old systems, reinventing the self. He sees acid not as a means of joining a cult, but as freeing of the individual. And what better rebel and individualist to represent this freedom than the famous Neil Cassidy, whose exploits had been amused for Kerouac? Easy holds wild parties called acid tests, which we've talked about a lot, dosing everyone with his new drug LSD to wild rock and roll music by a band called The Grateful Dead, whose leader, Jerry Garcia, had actually been hugely influenced by the writings of the Beats and considered himself a part of the Beat generation. And they all saw Neil Cassidy in near-mythical terms, the band going on to write songs about him and cementing his legend in the underground culture. 
And in 1964, when Ken Kesey gets a school bus, paints it psychedelic colors, and drives around the country distributing LSD to the masses, it's Neil Cassidy who famously drives it. Chapter 10, Naked Lunch in America. Grove Press had bought the American rights to Naked Lunch back in 1959, but printing and distribution kept getting delayed it would actually take nearly three years for the book to be released in the United States. Grove Press was this super edgy publisher at the time. They published D.H. Lawrence's Lady Chatterley's Lover and were working on putting out an American printing of Henry Miller's Tropic of Cancer. They'd even sent Henry Miller a copy of Naked Lunch for a blurb, but he didn't like it, said it was boring. But he said he thought the Marquis de Sade was boring as well. Grove Press printed up 10,000 copies of Naked Lunch. But before they could be distributed, Henry Miller's Tropic of Cancer hit shelves and caused a firestorm. 50 bookstore owners were arrested all over the country. Grove Press knew it was going to be controversial, but they had no idea how many lawsuits there would be in so many states. So... Naked Lunch just sat in a warehouse for a long time. Eventually, the Florida court case went all the way to the Supreme Court, who declared Tropic of Cancer to not be pornographic, and bookstores were now allowed to freely sell the book. When that finally settled, Grove Press released Naked Lunch on November 20th, 1962, and copies flew off the shelves. In just a few weeks, nearly 8,000 copies had sold. But then the inevitable happened. Detectives in Boston arrested bookstore owner Theodore Mavrikos for selling naked lunch, calling it pornography. It didn't help the case that this was Theodore's ninth arrest. And he often did sell actual pornography. Austin was famous for manning books. Theodore Dreiser's An American Tragedy had been deemed lewd and obscene way back in 1930 and was still banned in Boston. On January 12th, 1965, the Boston trial was held to decide whether naked lunch was obscene. The first witness was John Ciardi, poetry editor of the Saturday Review and translator of Dante's Divine Comedy. He compared naked lunch to the Divine Comedy, saying how Dante used profanity throughout it and had a commander playing the trumpet with his rectum, much like the talking asshole in Naked Lunch. Witnesses from the academic world all confirmed that William Burroughs is writing from a moral perspective, trying to horrify and revolt, not to titillate and provoke. Professor Norman Holland even called it a religious book about original sin. Norman Mailer said he'd read the book three times and that Burroughs was perhaps the most talented writer in America. And then Burroughs' old friend and lover, Allen Ginsberg, took the stand and said the drug addiction in the book was a metaphor for the addiction to consumer goods and power, an addiction to control. But the judge ruled on March 23rd, 1965, that the book was obscene. Undaunted, Grove Press appealed the decision, and the case was brought to the Massachusetts Supreme Court, who ruled in a triumph for our First Amendment rights on July 7th, 1966, that Naked Lunch was not obscene, but literature, and not utterly without any redeeming social value. A dissenting judge did say that it was, quote, a revolting miasma of unrelieved perversion and disease. It was, in truth, literary sewage, end quote. (laughs) A revolting miasma of unrelieved perversion. (laughs) That's That's a good blurb there. (laughs) Can't they both be right? I say, why not? (laughs) But this ruling marked the end of literary censorship in the United States. Naked Lunch was the last work of literature to be censored by the U.S. Post Office, the Customs Service, and by a state government. Nothing as transgressive as Naked Lunch had ever been cleared before. Naked Lunch made Tropic of Cancer look like a children's book. If it couldn't be banned, no book could. Americans were finally free to read whatever they wanted, thanks to William S. Burroughs. Like it or not, 
William S. Burroughs is a true American hero and icon. Chapter 11, Fatherhood. Back in Tangiers in 1963, Burroughs, who'd always felt terribly guilty about his namesake son, Billy, decided to give fatherhood a go, hoping to bond with him. So he flew his namesake and only child to the tip of Africa to live with him. Billy was 16 now, with a rebellious streak all his own. He wasn't impressed with Morocco, which struck Burroughs as odd as he himself would have loved the adventure and exoticness of being in a foreign land at that age. But Billy did love smoking hash, and Burroughs bought him his own keef pipe. Burroughs enrolled Billy in the American school, but after just three days, he quit. Burroughs, ever the anarchist, couldn't ethically force him to do something he didn't want to, to be a part of what Billy saw as a system of repression. So Billy just sat around smoking keef and eating hash candy, and there was the awkwardness of the men and gay scene that inevitably swirled around Burroughs. Try as he might, Burroughs just could not communicate with his son on a deeper level. It just wasn't working. Something Burroughs blamed himself for, his inability to show emotion. And soon Billy went back to his grandparents, who'd retired to Florida. For a while, Burroughs got very much into Scientology. He loved their auditing techniques, where an e-meter would be used to see if an emotional response was registered during a type of analysis. Everything about Scientology appealed to Burroughs. The weird technological gizmos, the strange language, the deep introspection. Obviously, there was only one problem. The hierarchy and hero worship of L. Ron Hubbard. Burroughs was an anarchist who didn't fit in with or take orders from anyone. And he didn't think that Hubbard was that charismatic or even that great of a writer. Certainly, William Burroughs was not going to take orders from L. Ron Hubbard or any of the other Scientologists. But he did love his e-meter, and he was always experimenting with it. Burroughs traveled about, spending most of his time in London, but returned to the U.S. to write an article for Playboy, returning to his hometown of St. Louis to remiss over his youth and how different the world was. He ended up in New York City, staying for a while at the Chelsea Hotel, because of course he did. The <laughs> Chelsea, <laughs> the Chelsea calling to him like it did with so many artists and luminaries. Science fiction writer Arthur C. Clarke was actually living there on the top floor, and Burroughs would spend evenings with him discussing crazy science fiction concepts and gazing out of Arthur Clarke's telescope. He also spent time with Andy Warhol and, the, and his burgeoning group of superstar freaks and musicians. His father died. He attended the funeral in Florida. He'd stopped receiving the $200 a month allowance after his first advance for naked lunch, which had been a mistake because payments had not been steady or easy to procure. And of course, he was writing. The soft machine, the ticket that exploded, and the Nova Express were what he called his mythology of the space age, taking the concepts from Naked Lunch with a war between the Nova police and the Nova mob. Nova Express was the most linear and traditional of the books. When the Beatles released their seminal album, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, in 1967, with the famous 48 celebrities on the cover, there was William Burroughs, along with Edgar Allan Poe and Aleister Crawley. But Billy is getting into all kinds of bad trouble. His grandparents had enrolled him in a boarding school in Florida, and he'd started doing speed, ran away twice. Once he'd gotten arrested for vagrancy in New York City and called Allen Ginsberg to bail him out. He was out of control. And in February of 1968, the impossible happened. Neil Cassidy died. The symbol of life exuberance, youth, dead, just before his 42nd birthday. Like many of their generation, beaten down by liquor and drugs, he'd been found in Mexico, collapsed by a set of railroad tracks. His cause of death listed on his autopsy simply as general congestion in all systems. Ken Kesey would later write about him, in an essay entitled The Day After Superman Died, saying, 
Neil Cassidy, also known as Superman, the fastest man alive, and the Holy Ghost. He appears as Houlihan in this story, in John Cleland Holmes' novel, Go. He is called Hart Kennedy. But his most famous fictional incarnation is as Dean Moriarty, the central figure and hard-driving force of Kerouac's On the Road, the novel that in 1957 first told most of us about the Beat Generation. In August of 1968, William Burroughs was hired by Esquire to attend the Democratic Convention in Chicago with Ginsburg. There were 10,000 hippie protesters versus 16,000 Chicago police officers, 4,000 state police officers, and 4,000 National Guard that would result in a literal bloodbath in the streets shown live on television beamed across the planet as police bashed and clubbed protesters. Burroughs was able to use his invisible man ruse to escape most of the melee, dressed as always in a three-piece suit and snap-brim fedora. But seeing these masses protesting the systems of control, many inspired by his own writing and life, made him believe he needed to be in America, that this was where the real change was happening, not dreary old England thinking they'd never come out to Buckingham Palace and say, quote, bugger the queen. That's England's problem. He's so punk rock. <laughs> and eventually uh, they did do that. This, remember the Sex Pistols signed their uh, record contract right there in front of Buckingham Palace? <laughs> yes, yes, from our previous show. Yeah. While he was in Chicago, his old friend Jack Kerouac stopped by to see him on his way to give an interview with William F. Buckley on the television show Firing Line. William Burroughs was surprised to see his friend Jack Kerouac bloated, inarticulate, and slurring his words. Jack had always been so articulate, so elegant, and well-spoken, so literate. And now rumor was he was always like this, that he woke up in the morning and immediately drank a glass of whiskey, slurred his words, and stumbled around in a drunken stupor. Kerouac asked Burroughs to come to the interview with him, but Burroughs said, No, no. Jack, don't go. You're not in any condition to go. But Kerouac went, appearing on the show to discuss these new bohemians, the hippies. Kerouac, unlike his suave appearances on the Steve Allen show where he'd read hipster poetry, was disheveled and disorderly, sometimes breaking out into song, sometimes yelling out into the audience to his friend Ginsburg. Kerouac tells Buckley that he's a Republican and a Catholic, but he says the hippies are good kids, better than the Beats, who were just a bunch of degenerates. A year later, Burroughs was in London. It was October 22nd, 1969. The day overcast and gray, spitting down rain. When he was slammed with waves of deep depression and sadness, feeling utterly forlorn and wretchedly despondent and sorrowful. When a friend walked in and told him, Jack Kerouac was dead. Kerouac was living with his mother and third wife in Florida when he began vomiting up blood, his cirrhotic liver rejecting the blood that it was supposed to clean, the blood bursting through weak veins and up into his esophagus. At 47 years old, the king of the beats, the man who had defined a generation, drank himself to death and drowned in his own blood. The only people for me are the mad ones, the ones who are mad to live, mad to talk, mad to be saved, desirous of everything at the same time. The ones who never yawn or say a commonplace thing, but burn, 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 like fabulous yellow Roman candles exploding like spiders across the stars. And in the middle, you see that blue center light pop, and everybody goes, ah. Oh. To Burroughs, it was a cancer of control that had killed his friend. Control from the press, the Catholic Church, control from media, and control from the image of the Beat King. Control from his fans and his agent and even his friends, the bookstores and reporters and everyone who wanted a piece of him. Control from his mother, his meme there at the end, and who refused to say what the last thing he wrote in his notebook was. Control from it all. Just like Neil Cassidy, martyrs to a system of control. Chapter 12, The Godfather of Punk. As the 60s turned into the 70s, 
Burroughs did what he always did, hold up and wrote, penning the last words of Dutch Schultz. Exploring new avenues of creativity, he wrote this one in the form of a postmodern screenplay. Publishers Weekly called it, quote, a gruesome hallucinatory exposition, end quote. And the Wild Boys, a classic about packs of gay warriors with their own language that reproduced by cloning so that they were self-generating and could live without any women at all. The book also introduced a new version of William, Audrey Carson's. Burroughs now abandoning his junkie agent, William Lee, from many of his other books, becoming reborn in 1973 Burroughs was invited to teach at City College in New York City for a class where each year a prestigious author is brought the year before Clockwork Orange author Anthony Burgess had taught he took the job excited to discuss literature with a new generation but found the students lacking saying they were reading comic books and not paying attention there was only one truly interested person, and he wasn't even in the class, wasn't even a student, just a wannabe writer who was sneaking in to listen to Burroughs and study at his feet. Burroughs, ever the anarchist, not only didn't kick him out of the class, but befriended him. Billy, meanwhile, had returned to boarding school and had fallen in love with a 17-year-old girl named Karen Perry and gotten married. He settled down in her hometown of Savannah, Georgia, and started writing and drinking, cranking out two novels, Speed and Kentucky Ham, which got favorable reviews and showed a promising start. Meanwhile, William Burroughs moved into 222 Bowery, which had once been a YMCA, and now he had a personal secretary, this guy James Grauerholtz from Kansas who says a pair of twins had given him a copy of Naked Lunch as a child, and it had changed his life. And I don't want to be rude or anything, but I have to say, this guy looks so much like Jeffrey Dahmer that it's uncanny. And I'm sure he's a great guy. He hung out with William Burroughs to the end. They had a weird relationship. They were they were lovers for like a hot second, but then they took on more of like a father-son kind of relationship. But um, I don't know. Watch the documentary Burroughs. It's on the Criterion channel right now. And you'll get an image of this secretary who hung out with him until his end. Burroughs got the old locker room, a huge windowless concrete space that became known as the bunker. The rent was only $250. Burroughs claimed a ghost named Toby lived in the bunker that he hasn't seen but is aware of his existence. A ghost from when it was a YMCA. While he didn't enjoy teaching, Burroughs found a new great passion and moneymaker, readings. He was asked in April to read at St. Mark's Church in the village, and it was a huge happening, an event spread far and wide by his newest disciple, Patty Smith. Now, a weird thing happened in the 70s. While Allen Ginsberg and Neil Cassidy had become hippie icons in the 60s, Ginsberg growing his hair all long and wearing robes and sandals and love beads, William Burroughs had mostly scoffed at them and their flower power and peace and love rhetoric. And all the hippies had generally ignored William Burroughs as well. But in the darkness of the 70s, the underground poets, the punk rockers, the goths, the street performers, they all found a true hero, an icon in him. I mean, he'd invented the word heavy metal, after all. He was a living symbol of rebelliousness, and a culture of darkness. Lou Reed of the Velvet Underground famously said nothing would exist without Burroughs. He gave them inspiration, showed them they could be queer, do drugs, explore taboo subjects like drug addiction, and experiment with their sexuality. William Burroughs had literally ended censorship laws on gay writing. David Bowie was a huge fan and said he even used the cut-up method to write songs inspired by Burroughs as did Jello Biafra in The Dead Kennedys. Debbie Harry from Blondie read all his books. The Talking Heads adored him. The band Steely Dan named themselves after a sex toy featured in Naked Lunch. Iggy Pop wrote songs in the Burroughs universe, writing about Johnny Yen from The Ticket That Exploded and Hypnotized Chickens. And Patti Smith hailed him as one of the greatest poets of all time, glorifying and championing him, becoming his adoring groupie. He was crowned the godfather of punk, something Burroughs would disavow, saying, 
A punk is someone who gets it up the ass in prison. And I ain't no punk. <laughs> but you could see he loved this new generation of fans. So much cooler and suaver and realer than those silly hippies and all their flowers. There's footage you can find of Ginsburg and Burroughs reuniting in 1981 with their old friend, murderer, Lucien Carr. And Ginsburg asking Burroughs what's he's, what he's been up to. And Burroughs proudly saying that he now gave readings at punk shows, an impish smile on his wizened face. Punks had come to age raised on the concept of nuclear annihilation and a fear of the bomb in a Cold War world. What Burroughs had foretold and seen right from the beginning of the atomic age, a generation like this. Punks sought to short circuit control and saw the world as a mirror maze of bureaucracies. Exactly like William Burroughs. Way back in 1956, Burroughs was prophesizing the new movement, saying in Naked Lunch, Rock and roll adolescent hoodlums storm the streets of all nations. They open zoos, insane asylums, prisons, burst water mains with air hammers, chop the floor out of passenger plane lavatories, shoot out lighthouses. Turn sewers into water supplies. Throw sharks and stingrays, electric eels, and kandiru into swimming pools. That was them. That was their spirit. This new breed of counterculture. And his readings back then were amazing. Uh, you can find a lot of them on YouTube. And uh, much of his work is just bleak, pitch black humor. Kerouac always said he was the world's greatest satirist in the mold of Jonathan Swift. And the audiences would inevitably be laughing uproariously as he talked about Dr. Benway dropping ashes from his cigarette into an open surgical wound. He gave readings with Tennessee Williams, Eudora Wheatley, and even Stephen King, which must have been am amazing. Can you imagine seeing Stephen King and William Burroughs giving readings yes. together? I did not know that that happened. I don't know how I didn't know that. That's very cool. I honestly didn't either. <laughs> <laughs> In 1979, Allen Ginsberg was elected to the Institute of Arts and Letters and in February was awarded the Gold Medal for Literary Merit by the National Arts Club. Burroughs attended and was delighted, seeing the shocked faces on the dignified, prim and proper old ladies and bourgeois literary elites when Allen read a poem entitled Cocksucker Blues. They were still literary outlaws. Chapter 13. Billy. Though he'd managed to get two novels written and published, Billy's life was an utter mess. He'd become a lush. His wife was cheating on him. So he decides to hit the road, like all the beats before him, trying to live up to his father's image. He headed to Santa Cruz, California, countercultural hot spot in the hippie mecca, living like a hobo, sleeping under bridges and eating out of garbage cans, scribbling his drunken feverish thoughts out in the notebooks. At one point, he sees a doctor who tells him, quote, well, my young friend, you have a liver the size of Baltimore. He was only 28 years old. The prognosis terrified him, and he quit drinking alcohol. In 1978, he moved to Boulder, Colorado, to be a teacher's assistant to Allen Ginsberg, who was teaching at the Naropa Institute under the Jack Kerouac School of the Disembodied Poet program. Billy gave a reading, and crazy old-school beat poet Gregory Corso drunkenly heckled him, screaming, Is that supposed to be a stanza? What kind of sentence is that? You ain't the writer your father is, Billy boy. And it's sad, you know, because he's actually a really good writer. I read Speed and Kentucky Ham, and I thought they were great, you know. Uh, but I like a clear storyline. For me, like a, 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 a easy to read story is better than this experimental, weird, strange, non-linear, cut up stuff. I mean, I respect it, and and if people like it, that's all cool. It's just me personally. But um, Billy Burroughs, uh, William Burroughs' son, he reminds me a lot of Bukowski. He's like kind of like a nicer Bukowski. <laughs> oh, that's saying something. 
Billy was then asked to read with his father in Berkeley in Santa Cruz, but he didn't want to do it, saying he was terrified of crowds and just a nobody, that he'd felt like a sprig of parsley. But William wrote him, encouraging him to do the readings with him, saying, We writers must be practical. Writing is a very depleting, exacting, dangerous, and underpaid profession. And the basic and vital advice I can give to any young writer is, Pay attention to your finances. In the words of Wilson Misner, don't turn down any money. It seems now that in order to survive, we must become performers as well and peddle our wares like purveyors of snake oil. At the same time, readings can be fun, and I am looking forward to our joint readings at Santa Cruz and Berkeley. That reading, sadly, wouldn't happen. Although Billy was now sober, his liver wasn't healing, and one day he threw up blood, just like Jack Kerouac. His diseased liver was unable to receive the blood flowing into it. But as luck would have it, 30 miles away in Denver lived the man who had pioneered the liver transplant, Dr. Thomas Earl Starzl, and the Colorado General Hospital where he worked was the world's only surgical unit capable of performing liver transplants at that time. While waiting for a donor liver, a, a port caval shunt was performed to bypass the flow of blood to the liver and prevent backup. And Billy fell into a liver coma, lost consciousness, and had to be hooked up to a life support system. His lungs were medically paralyzed, and he was placed on a breathing machine as well. When William Burroughs entered the hospital room and looked at his son lying there, enmeshed in all the medical equipment, tubes, and straps, and wires, he was utterly overcome. One of the beat poets from the Ropa who was in the room wanted to read a passage from the Tibetan Book of the Dead, which Burroughs knew was an encouragement to the dying to move on into the great beyond. And Burroughs also understanding the power of suggestion in altered states, exploded, screaming at him, God damn it, don't read that thing to him. He's in a fucking coma and he just might listen to it. Six days later, a 25-year-old woman named Virginia Wohan died of a stroke from a tumor on her carotid artery and her liver was harvested and put into the body of William Burroughs III, Billy. But there were many complications. The average hospital stay after a liver transplant is just three weeks. But Billy remained in the hospital for four months. He would get huge painful abscesses and have to have them surgically drained of pus. His abdomen had to be irrigated three times a day by this big sucking machine that made all these weird noises. And the wound had to be left open to heal. The steroids and pain medication did strange things to his mind as well, sending him into deep, dark depressions and feelings of hopelessness. But he eventually got better and was discharged and was picked up from the hospital by none other than John Steinbeck's son, John Jr. They were old friends. Steinbeck had been in Vietnam on a television crew for six years. The two had a strong kinship, both the sons of famous writers they'd been named after. They'd both been epic drunks, and John had experienced liver burnout, too. But he was lucky, and his liver had healed itself once he stopped drinking. But Billy started drinking again, showing up at readings wasted and leaking bile from his fistula, his clothes soaked in the stuff. He lashed out at his father's legacy, saying the cut-up method was just a reflection of his father's inability to deal directly with his own thoughts and feelings and made for shit writing. I don't know. He might have a point there about that too. <laughs> Billy went back to his beatnik ways, taking a train west, heading to Santa Cruz on a drinking bender, hitchhiking north to San Francisco where he scored some heroin. He stayed in Bolinas, a little hippie beach town just north of San Fran for a few weeks, but friends convinced him to go back to Denver. He did, but he continued to drink. The steroids he had to eat for the liver to be accepted by his body, causing him to fall into an irrational anger and rage. He ended up in a psychiatric unit, 
where he was diagnosed as a chronic alcoholic with sociopathic personality disorder. It was 1978. He'd only had his new liver for slightly over a year, and he was already well on his way to destroying it. Burroughs visited his son often in Boulder, gave him money whenever he needed it, tried to be a father in the awkward, weird way. He tried to be anything. He thought about asking Billy to move in with him in the bunker in New York City. But the Bowery seemed a dangerous place to bring Billy, who'd most likely fall in with all the bums and addicts that sat on the street outside. Boulder seemed a much safer place for him. Billy continued to drink and get more abscesses and have to be rehospitalized and operated on again and again. In late May of 1979, Billy wrote his father, asking for $500 to buy a car with. Burroughs wrote him back, saying, Now suppose you have a $500 car. What next? Where are you going to go? What about your hospital checkups and your medication? Avoiding alcohol? The question is not the $500. The question is just what do you want to do and where do you want to go? Sooner or later, son, you have to decide. Billy wrote his father a scathing letter. Father, I wouldn't be on goddamn welfare if I hadn't spent most of my life doped up, beginning with an attempt to understand you. What in God's name are you anyway, with your wretchedly evil entourage of bullet gun and mayhem freaks? I'm 31 years old, and it's none of your goddamn bother where I'm going. Did you answer a four-year-old child whose mother you had just murdered when he asked, where are you going? You don't impress me a bit with all this be careful bullshit. You could care less and your fucking wallet is full of blood. All of my life I've tried to experience you as something approaching a human being. By God in heaven you blew it. God's mercy on you and your blood-bought money. Your cursed from birth offspring. P.S. From one who has intensely studied your work all his life. Let it be known that everything since Naked Lunch is tripe of the worst con artist type as far as art goes. That's your kind, con. But he had second thoughts and never sent the letter. Burroughs would later find it in his belongings. Oof, that's almost worse. Just I don't know. Is it heart. worse? I, th- I wonder yeah. that. I'm like, is it worse to read it in the belongings? I, don't, I think it's not because then there was like, um, it showed that he had some doubt. Like, you know, maybe he didn't feel entirely that way. Like, he didn't send it. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I guess. I suppose. It, it's harsh, though. But is it that he would later find it in his belongings after Billy was dead? Yeah. I don't know. That to me seems worse. If he sent it and you hashed it out, it would, I don't know. Right, Like maybe he didn't send it because he did think it was so true and he didn't want to crush him as opposed to if he had sent it. It was just like in a moment of rage and he knew it would just antagonize him and they could work through it kind of thing. I don't know. Yeah. That's where I was going when I was like, that's kind of worse. But (laughs) yeah, anyhow. Billy devolved, living like a tramp, a hobo. Sometimes his pores would open and he would bleed out them like perspiration. He was picked up for vagrancy and brought to the West Volusia County Hospital, suffering from pneumonia and hepatitis. He had lice and scabies and his clothing was so filthy the hospital burned it. After being discharged, he got a room in a dilapidated former resort hotel and stopped taking his steroids, knowing that would bring about liver rejection and death. A nurse brought him to church services, and he sat through half the sermon, cursing under his breath the entire time, then got up and walked out. He staggered through the streets, feverish and sick, stumbling into a ditch by the side of the road, where he lay back and shut his eyes, falling into a deep slumber. A passerby found him and took him to the hospital, where he was pronounced dead at 6.30 in the morning on March 3rd, 1981. Chapter 14. The Pope of Dope. Burroughs was now the celebrated godfather of punk rock, and for many in the punk scene, heroin was very chic, very cool. And what could be cooler than shooting smack with the Pope of Dope himself, William Burroughs? Heroin pilgrims came to the bunker with their best products, eager to turn the old man on, to get high with the doctor, as many called him. And Burroughs started up another habit. It numbed the pain. Now this new terrible pain, the death of Billy, a new thing to blame himself for. 
William Burroughs is 66 years old. It's New Year's Eve. He just finished a novel he'd been working on for years, Cities of the Red Knight. He's at a party, small, intimate affair, where hash brownies are being served. He eats copious amounts, then suggests maybe they should shoot up some heroin as they wait for the cannabis to kick in. Guests arrive and he smoked joints with them all night while slamming back glass after glass of vodka, all while wearing an impeccable three-piece suit and quoting Shakespeare perfectly. This is who William Burroughs was. He was a fucking mutant. He gave readings across the country, able to keep his heroin habit going because of the adoring fans who would show up to worship at the feet of the Pope of Dope and bring him the finest smack that was out there. His veins receded, and he only had two good ones left, one in his left hand and another in his foot, and he'd have to have others inject him with the syringe. Cities of the Red Knight was released. Visionary English writer J.G. Ballard wrote a review calling Burroughs, quote, the first mythographer of the mid-20th century and the lineal successor to James Joyce, to whom he bears more than a passing resemblance. Exile, publication in Paris, undeserved notoriety as a pornographer, and an absolute dedication to the word. His novels are the first definitive portrait of the inner landscape of our mid-century, using its unique language and manipulative techniques, its own fantasies and nightmares. The book sold well, and the publisher, Dick Seaver of Holt, Reinhardt, and Winston, was praised for bringing Burroughs back to life. He appeared on Saturday Night Live, hailed as the greatest living writer in America, reading about the crazy surgical exploits of Dr. Benway as the national anthem droned in the background, then staring defiantly into the camera, watery blue eyes wild and wide, a grim smirk on his face, nodding dementedly and proclaiming, I am the doctor. A hundred million people were watching. But as he grew older and closer to his 70s, the godfather of punk and the pope of dope decided to make some major life changes. He previously said that going from heroin to methadone was foolish, like switching from whiskey to port wine. But he decided to give it a go, get on the methadone program, and kick heroin once and for all. He'd stay on methadone the rest of his life. And he decided he had enough of New York City. He wanted a house and some land and decided to settle right in the middle of the heartland in Lawrence, Kansas, about four hours east of his childhood home in St. Louis, Missouri. He and his secretary, James, first moved into a house in the country where their cat, Ruski, could run free and Burroughs could target practice. But then they settled into a more suburban one-story house on Leonard Street. It was on a tree-shaded street on almost an acre with a large backyard. He settled into a domesticity of sorts, still giving the occasional reading, answering letters from adoring fans and the simply curious. A fifth grader asked him if he believed in God. A fan wrote a letter addressed to the master of all pus, saying, quote, you are truly God. Burroughs wrote him back, saying, You got me wrong. I am but a humble practitioner of the Scrivener's trade. God, not me. I don't have the qualifications. Old Sarge told me years ago, don't be a volunteer, kid. God is always trying to foist his lousy job onto someone else. And you gotta be crazy to take it. I'm just a tech sergeant in the Shakespeare squadron. And then Burroughs was inducted into the American Academy and Institute of Arts and Letters. It had all been Allen Ginsberg's doing. He'd pulled every stunt possible to make it happen. But it had. William Burroughs was a member of the esteemed American Academy of Institute of Arts and Letters. He was 69 years old. He had five cats, which he would affectionately call his beasts, saying, Here's my little calico beast. Oh, she's such a sweetheart. Filmmaker John Waters had been a diehard William Burroughs fan since he was a teenager and said without Burroughs, he wouldn't be who he was, that Burroughs was crucial to his understanding of himself as a person and an artist. 
and Burroughs had been a big fan of John's as well, loving his films. And in 1986, William Burroughs officially anointed John Waters the Pope of Trash, an honor he relished and still holds dear to this day. Burroughs developed a new type of painting where he shot at dangling cans of spray paint hanging in front of plywood panels with a shotgun, blasting the paint and buckshot all over the wood. He loved the utter randomness of the patterns created, the purity of its form, each painting being utterly unique. And it was like the cut-up method in that it fractured both time and space. For his 70th birthday, an honorary dinner was given in New York City at the hipster club The Limelight. Kurt Vonnegut attended, as did Sting, and of course old friends like Allen Ginsberg and writer Terry Southern. His libido waned, and he came to the realization that it wasn't the actual act of sex he'd always desired, but the idea of it, the fantasy. The reality was never that great. It was just the idea of it that made it such a compulsion. Then Place of Dead Roads was released, the second book in his new trilogy. He was wiser, but he was still cranky and nihilistic, saying, All the political and social chaos we see now reflects a much deeper biological crisis. I would gladly get rid of a whole street full of people to save one Kaluga. The incomparable gliding Olimar in the rainforest of Borneo. I'm not committed to the human species. I want to move into space. I can't tell you how utterly unhappy I am here. When asked if he didn't love life, though, he was more positive, saying, mm, I do love life. I love my cats, which, which is the same thing. To get drunk and say bold things to shock his guests, voice slightly slurred and a mischievous glint in his eye. If they oppose the gay state, we're going to find them, track them down, and kill them. And why not? Still having fun and being an iconoclast, taunting the establishment with his words, telling guests, This world would be pretty easy and pleasant place to live if everybody could just learn to mind their own goddamn business. And let others do the same. But as a wise old black faggot said to me years ago, some people are shits, darling. And I was never able to forget it. But there was much to be happy about. He'd switched agents and gotten a very large new publishing deal and was finally going to release Queer, the sequel of sorts to Junkie. He had written way back in the 50s. Queer, which is written in a very straightforward, linear style, written before Naked Lunch, was very well received and received excellent reviews. He was given the title Commandeur des Arts de Lettres in France. I don't know why I said France. <laughs> in France and wore the rosette on his lapel, as well as the rosette for the American Academy and Institute of Arts and Letters, saying... Mm, they help get you through customs. <laughs> He was still giving readings, using them as a means of traveling the world and visiting old friends. In Amsterdam and Paris, where queer was in the front windows of every bookstore and selling wildly and being acclaimed. To New York City, where he was greeted as visiting royalty. Cab drivers waved out the windows at him, yelling, hey, Burroughs! Waiters in restaurants called him a genius, provoking a man at the next table to ask him, how does it feel to be a genius? Burroughs saying, no, oh, I'm used to it. <laughs> he returned to the docile life in Kansas, finishing Western Lands, the final book in the new trilogy, painting, getting weird with his cats, whom he thought may or may not be possessed by aliens or demons. At the release party for Western Lands, there was some weird old man rudely sitting in Burroughs' chair. And who should it be but that old junkie, Hunky? It was a miracle he was still alive. Out of all the people who'd come and gone, here was that crazy 1940s street hustler alive and well. The two had a fine time reminiscing about old times. And in 1989, he made a legendary appearance in Gus Van Sant's film Drugstore Cowboy, where he played an old junkie priest delivering some classic lines. Codeine, this stuff's four squares. Ah, oh, to lot it. 
Bless you, my son. I grant you an indulgence. And he started working with Tom Waits and signed on to write the libretto to the rock operetta, the Black Rider casting of the magic bullets, based on the Faust myth. Which is some really cool stuff. Uh, give it a listen if you're a fan of Tom Waits. He started appearing in Gap and Nike ads, which is insane. Because he's so like this gay, junky writer of smut. It's not like wholesome Americana in a Nike ad, you know? And for a time, you could get a T-shirt that he had shot, which is uh, pretty cool. I, I actually want one. <laughs> I'm not surprised. <laughs> David Cronenberg made a film of Naked Lunch, which Burroughs was an advisor of sorts to and was often on the set of. It was deemed a brilliant vision and was highly acclaimed and won a lot of awards. It was awful mean to Kerouac and Ginsburg, though. <laughs> and Burroughs and Ginsburg were still up to their wild beat ways, seeking out new experiences and different types of wisdom. And they had a sweat lodge conducted by a Navajo shaman trying to banish the invader. William felt might be inside of him, this insidious evil force. But I just love the uh, idea of these two old beatniks in their 70s, naked and in this tent with a Native American shaman praying. And it worked. The shaman discovered a winged and eyeless white skull inside of Burroughs and banished it, saying it was the worst case he'd ever handled, that the evil spirit almost overpowered him. And the faithful continued to seek Burroughs out. Kurt Cobain making the pilgrimage to Lawrence, Kansas, to play guitar in a project the two collaborated on, called The Priest They Called Him. In 1994, William Burroughs turned 80 years old, and the Institute of Contemporary Arts held a week-long tribute to him. In 1995, a collection of Burroughs' dreams and random thoughts was released, showing a more subdued Burroughs, but a still nihilistic one. What a horrible, loudish planet this is. The dominant species consists of sadistic morons, faces bearing the hideous liniment of spiritual famine, swollen with stupid hate. Hopeless rubbish. In 1996, the Los Angeles County Museum of Arts held an exhibit with his shotgun paintings and collages. William sat on stage and answered questions from the audience. What do you think of the internet? I think it's a step in the right direction. Why did you pick Lawrence, Kansas as a place to live? Lawrence won by default. Why are you a member of the National Rifle Association? I'm a member, but... I haven't paid my dues. I just don't care about the negatives. If we shoot each other, too bad. What can I do about it? Who are your favorite authors? Shakespeare, Joseph Conrad, Franz Kafka, and Graham Greene. What phrase do you like of Shakespeare's? Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. A tale told by an idiot. Burroughs was 83 and lived the life of an elderly beatneck freak. He woke up, took his methadone, and went back to bed. After a light breakfast, he'd play with his cats and read gun magazines and pulp fiction. Then cocktail hour was at three, where he drank vodka and cokes. Then he'd write for his own personal use, diaries and thoughts, smoking joints as he explored his inner mind through words. At around six-ish, friends would inevitably arrive, and he'd entertain until nine and then go to bed. A life of contemplation and altered states. He'd found a way to survive by short-circuiting control. But in March of 1997, his dear friend Allen Ginsberg called with some bad news. Allen had inoperable liver cancer, and doctors had given him just months to live. And on April 5th, at 71 years old, Allen Ginsberg died. Alan had been so much to William. At first, he'd been a son of sorts. Then he'd become a lover, a friend, and in the end, almost a father figure. They were soulmates, twin flames, best friend, kindred spirits. Then, just four months later, on August 2nd, 1997, at 83 years old, 
William Burroughs passed away as well. Just before he died, he did what he always did. He wrote, scribbling away, using words to understand and try to comprehend this crazy world we mortals live in. And here, ladies and gentlemen, are the last words of William S. Burroughs. Love, what is it? Most natural painkiller what there is. Love. And so, the last word ever written by William Burroughs, notorious outlaw and deviant, drug addict and writer of nihilism, was love. Love. And that's where we're going to end this portrait of American icon, William Burroughs. And, you know, there's so much more that we wanted to include. There's just no room. We didn't get to talk about orgone boxes, these wooden boxes lined with metal that restored your vital life energy and other wild medical beliefs and health theories or his weapons like he walked around with a cane that had a razor sharp knife in the handle and of course the countless crazy characters he hung out with over the years just so so many and all the writers he influenced especially science fiction writers like William Gibson who created cyberpunk from Burroughs and all the bands like Sonic Youth and Ministry the Johnny Cash song Cocaine Blues which is about him so much it would have been too long I don't know what do you listeners think should we have more multi-part episodes three parts four parts you want us to keep it succinct let us know we'd like to hear so what do you think Krista did you have fun Uh, this you are entirely what you wrote about our part one in that the final product of that podcast was like everything that you had learned as an you know, audio storyteller and a, a podcaster and a, and a video editor or a sound editor everything that you've learned thus far in this journey was put into that and i completely agree so um i definitely think this was a true um a true oh, what the fuck is the word i'm trying to say you're gonna have to edit this part out not a, <laughs> just a success but like a true you were truly a visionary in putting these episodes together. So I think it was going to be a massive success with our listeners, not just people who are interested in bizarre, you know, crimes and tragedies and, and, you know, uh, kind of dark things, but also people that are interested in, in these, this group of writers. So I think it'll, it'll appeal to multiple people on multiple fronts. Oh, yay! Thanks. Yeah, but yeah, we want to hear, as always, from our listeners and and get their thoughts. How do you feel about it? Oh, man, um, I had so much fun. I just, I like, I love these guys, and it was so much fun going into all the craziness and insanity and learning new things I didn't know, and just, what a weird, wild fucking time. What a history, man. Agreed, wild, and now we have this very, uh, if not succinct, then very, you know, comprehensive and um, well put together uh, sort of narrative journey of William Burroughs and then some of the more tragic aspects of his long and productive and very fucking interesting life. Yeah, our little addition. And, you know, um, if you're interested in William Burroughs, definitely check out. uh, There's two amazing documentaries out there. Uh, One's called Burroughs the Movie. And that is actually on the Criterion channel right now. And then there's another one called Burroughs A Man Inside. And that was made after his death, but it has, like, some amazing footage of him in his, like, last years. Um, Both of them have, like, the same narrators. Iggy Pop, John Waters, Patti Smith. Um... And definitely, if you're really interested, read the book Literary Outlaw, The Life and Times of William Burroughs by Ted Morgan. It's exhaustive. It's where we got a lot of information from. Amazing book. And, um, you know, these guys were all writing about each other. So read Kerouac, read fucking Ginsburg. They're all talking about themselves. You can get the history right from the horse's mouth there. Touche. Absolutely. All right, everybody. Well, thank you so much for listening and joining us on this incredible journey through the life and times of William Burroughs. Um, you know we want to hear from you. If you've got uh, something you'd like us to cover, you just want to say hi, drop us a line at 
murdercoasterpodcast at gmail.com. That's murdercoasterpodcast at gmail.com. We got a real spooky one coming up next week. It's going to be super fun, and we will see you then. Bye. See you then.